just you guys in the room, I could kill this lapel, right? Yes, you could. Yeah, I could take him off, and then I... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I know, I'm trying to... <laughs> okay. Yeah, you're probably fine. Watch your right... Okay, here, let me take that. I'm going to... So it starts at... So I still have five minutes till we're... I can make small talk. All right. My favorite. <laughs> Adam, you do look like you. I, I look like me? Yeah, I'm looking right now. Good, good, good. <laughs> I was going to say. So you can wander as far as, like, the edge of the chalkboard. Okay. And you Amazing. And as far, like, to your podium. Okay. that much of a window. Okay. A Very cool. Person. I am a wandering person. Yeah. Prone to wander, right? That's right. How's our focus? <laughs> it looks pretty good right now. I'll right? do my best not to wonder. I, I, I wouldn't worry about it. It's not a big deal. I'm going to take my wallet out of my pocket. I'm going to put this down in it. How would that be? That's great. All right, I'm walking away before. Before anything else goes bad? So is that on Facebook, Jack? Uh, is that what you're what on? I'm looking at now is off our website. Okay. I have Facebook, uh, Gmail, and that's Facebook right here. I got Facebook now, and you're live on Facebook. All right. Is anyone watching yet? How many Penn State fans here in the church? Are they all? Oh, well, that was some. All <laughs> you know, if they called that the opposite way, that it would have stood. That's what I said. You couldn't. It would have. Whatever they called in the field was going to stand. That yeah, there was. Exactly. There was no way to tell. Well, I guess now we I, see. I, I love the rank, the guy who slithered on. Um, he's in there. <laughs> pounding on. Well, you know what else was my favorite? And then I looked at something on the comments. I said, Don't worry. Oh, yeah. I mean, that was like, I so don't want to have a free day for lunch. He was six feet from home plate, oh, right? Yeah, and when, yeah. when the ball got there, and the guy dropped it, and, and the guy dotted you. <laughs> that must have probably been Andrew's a little. Yeah, both those games are at Duncan. Yeah. Or yeah, Penn State. Uh, well, then they play, uh, Penn State plays Ohio State next week. Yeah. 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 So it, it's, we're going to start out 0 2 probably here. That's. Yeah. <laughs> now we see why we, uh, now they see why they schedule those, 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 those first, first couple games that are. <laughs> there you go. That's why they do it. <laughs> Yep. You, 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 need to, you need to get your feel. Yeah. No, it's, 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 it's <laughs> keep scrolling. <laughs> For some reason, I'm not scrolling. I don't even go so far to scroll up the game, but I, I, I thought there was a, no, maybe there isn't a piece of that left. I guess it's not. Yeah, so sure. What time are you at here? I have 8.59. And it starts at nine, right? Yeah.
Okay. Should I start? Jump in? All right. Is there anyone online? Can you see? Okay, okay, cool. Well, I'm sure there is. There's no doubt about that. Okay. Uh, 16, I think we got. Okay, fun. Well, good morning. Uh, should I, am I good with the camera? Does anyone out there on a virtually? Can I, do I look okay? Okay. Um, good morning. It is, uh, thanks for having me here. I, my name is Adam Nagel. I am coming from, I, I love to say this, I work in Paradise, Pennsylvania. So you guys are the sweetest place on earth. I live in, I work in paradise. So uh, I'm part of the Factory Ministries. It is a human service agency, a Christian faith-based human service agency that uh, seeks to empower individuals um, and work in collaborative ways to build community. And so kind of want to kick this around. Jack connected with me last, I was scheduled to be here last March. Last March, and as you guys know, all the world fell apart uh, last March. So, um, give a quick introduction to who I am, and then I will uh, kind of share about the factories. So, I grew up in Lancaster County, went to Warwick High School, uh, graduated, graduated not following Jesus, though I grew up in a Christian home, made a lot of very poor decisions in life, um, a lot of pain, came to a place where I actually attempted suicide. Uh, reached out to my sister at the time, who was at a Bible school in upstate New York, and said, hey, I need help. Um, she encouraged me to attend the school. I attended this Bible school, and there really began to understand what it was to engage the scriptures um, on a regular, consistent basis and really interact and love Jesus uh, and, and what he's done for us uh, on the cross and through his resurrection. And so... That kind of set my life on a whole new trajectory. I met my wife there, and uh, we kind of leave. I was headed to school for social uh, work, is what I really was, was trying to get my heart into, specifically to work in foster care. That was my real heart. Um, and so, uh, long story short, it's, it's, I'll just kind of condense it into you know, a couple sentences. I was coaching football in the public school, and as I'm engaging that, and I have a lot of tension, I'm sitting in church on Sunday, and I'm watching the large majority, as I'd sit around and look around, a large majority of the congregation would sit like they're asleep. And it, it used to just nag at me. I'm like, you know, what, this, we have the power of the gospel. We're alive in Jesus. This is like, my heart is beating. I'm in Bible school at the time. I'm like, why do we look like we're all dead? And then I'm going to the public school, and I'm coaching uh, young men, uh, high school football. And high school football, <laughs> I played it. My dream was to, play, was to play big time football. I never quite made it. But high school football tends to attract angry young boys. And uh, boys that are, it's, it's just, I'm not saying everyone who plays football is an angry young man. But it, it attracts them, and, and kids and boys from tough places. And so I'm coaching in the public school. I'm engaging these kids on a consistent basis. And I'm like, man, I want to talk to you about Jesus so bad, but I can't because I'm an employee of the, in the public school. So in that moment, I'm looking at the church. I'm looking at coaching football. I'm trying to get into the foster care system. I attended a, um, a, a leadership conference in Philadelphia sitting in this massive church in an upper balcony. Uh, there's a speaker on the stage who began to talk about Acts chapter 2 uh, and, and Pentecost and what that early church looked like and how there was no one in need. And he, he ends the, hands his talk saying the local church is the hope of the world uh, because we steward the message of Jesus. My heart was pounding inside of me, and I am like, that's it. I need to be a pastor. I mean, if he, they didn't have an altar call, but if they did, I would have been, I would have jumped over that balcony and done everything I can to get to the front as fast as I could. Shifted my degree to pastoral ministry, set out and uh, served in pastoral ministry for, oh my, 14 years, I believe it was, and in various roles. Uh, most recently, nine years as a senior pastor, and um, kind of came to a place where uh, left that church to step into the factory ministries. Uh, my heart is really, my heart is, my heart beats for the local church to reclaim 
what it had before the 50s, if you will. Before 1950, and even go back a little further, when there was someone in need, they didn't look to the government, they looked to the church. The church provided the human services to our communities. Uh, now, World War I and II changed a lot of that. Our presidencies, uh, Roosevelt and some of the others that came along changed a lot of that. I'm not here to get into political conversations, whether that's good or bad. It is today, and we now have what we do, and we have now organizations like us that exist, and a lot of times churches that exist that don't quite know how to step in and care for the poor. Um, so that kind of leads me to where I'm at. Um, so that's introduction to who I am. I have four kids. Some are going to come along today. Uh, and they, I guess, too early to get up. So <laughs> one of them was up, and, and, and so she was, so I said, hey, I got to go. So I came without them. But uh, they're at home. I have an 18-year-old down to an 11-year-old, two boys, two girls. Uh, so that's a little bit about me. Uh, I love the local church. You guys, thanks for having me here. I love that you guys, even as I pulled in the property today, I noticed the, the house right across the street. That thrills my soul. Um, I, I, put, I smiled when I came in to see that, because uh, what I want to really encourage us with is how important it is to stay engaged in serving the under-resourced in our communities. It is so important, and it keeps the gospel message of Jesus human. So with that said, here's a little bit about the factory. And I want to say, feel free, you guys that are here, ask questions or online, pop questions in throughout this. I would love to keep it interactive. If I say something like, well, what does that mean? Or what does that look like? Or tell me more about that. Um, I want to be helpful to you guys in that. So um, last, last uh, March, March of 2020, uh, March 12th, the public schools in, I think statewide, but I, I don't know if it was true here or not, but I know in Lancaster, uh, all the public schools begin to announce we're going to shut down, which we thought that I'd still chuck with this. We thought two weeks. Like, I don't know what we were thinking. Like, this is, I don't know how we were going to get a pandemic under control in two weeks. Uh, but we all kind of had this idea. We're going to shut down for two weeks, see what can happen. Um, that's it. So on March 13th, I take a phone call uh, from the public school. Peckway Valley School District is the school district we sit in. Take a phone call from Jack is shaking his hand because he's, he, his roots are there. Um, so take a phone call from uh, Kathy Koenig is her name. She's the Director of Human Services. I want to just set the context here. We're a faith-based Christian human service agency. This is the public school. They immediately call us and say, we've got free and reduced lunches that we've got to continue to distribute. Can we bring them to your property? We instantly said yes. We have a very close relationship with the public school. Um, and uh, they shift that. Now, Peckway Valley has over 55% of their school population are on free and reduced lunch. So it is a high poverty threshold. Now, those of you that are familiar with the area, you know the Amish, maybe you head down to, it used to be Rockvale, now it's Tanger, and you continue out east towards Gap, and if you are, if you're going to hit anything tourist in the Amish, it's, it's our community. You drive through these beautiful uh, this beautiful farmland, much like what surrounds this area here, and you wouldn't see, po you don't see poverty, but it is, it is condensed, it is there, it is very real. This past year, we had 48 kids in Peckway Valley that were coded as homeless. Um, so, 55% of the kids on free and reduced lunch, I take this phone call, can we bring, can we bring the free and reduced lunches to your building? Um, it was a quick, easy yes, the lunches shift over, we begin to distribute lunches. As families are coming through, um, we, we serve food. Uh, we're a food. We have a food bank, we call it a market. So as families are coming through, uh, we are saying to them, hey, just so you know, if you're out of a job or struggling through this time, please reach out to us, we're here to walk with you. We picked up 200 families in that first month in our food programming. Um, now, I wanna pause there and I wanna back way up to talk about how all this sets up. In 1994, two churches, and this, is, this will kind of set the heart of who we are, two churches, which I don't know why this is, but churches have a hard time working together at times, when especially one was a Mennonite church and the other was a fundamental uh, evangelical church. And these two churches come together, they, they were a stone's throw away from each other and said, hey, in 1994, how can we further reach teenagers that we're not reaching? 
So they started what they called open door night at a neutral location for kids to come in. Uh, that grew, it's, it, um, it was called the Factory Youth Center. People say, well, this is where we get our name. The factory was an old sewing factory. It was, it was there, so that's where we, people, I always get this, where do you get this name, the factory? Um, so, this, so these kids are coming in. They had a little box that they would put prayer requests in every week. And as the youth leaders and the mentors are reading these prayer requests, they're beginning to realize something that is, I think most of us kind of intuitively know, and that is our dysfunctions, our brokenness, or the things a lot of us don't like about ourselves and the things we love about ourselves often come from our family of origin. And if you're really going to walk with a, a young person out of poverty, and especially in generational poverty, you've got to address the whole family system. So they're reading these prayer requests, and, and it's often about, hey, my mom is on drugs, my dad got arrested, my, and you're reading this stuff, and so they said, we've got to start a social service, human service, a, let's, let's have caseworkers and focus on the family. Uh, so they began to branch into um, adult services as well, um, had social workers, caseworkers that we call advocates that began to walk with adults in our community. Uh, so it expanded to a staff of about five, and that one of the original churches, um, the pastor of that church starts working with the executive director at the time and they begin to ask this question, how can we be a good neighbor? Like, let's just roll our sleeves up. So they start going, they went to the township supervisors. And they said, if we could do anything for you guys, what would it be? If we could give you, they'd, they'd usually attach a monetary number and a volunteer hour number. So this is one thing I would say, if, if you guys ever want to know, how do we really get into our community? This is a powerful way to do it. You just walk out and say, if we could give you $2,000 and 1,000 man hours, what could you do with it? So they started with the township supervisors. The township supervisors said, well, actually, we really need a new roof on the Boy Scout building. They built a new roof on the Boy Scout building. Um, they continue to go to other, just who's in the town square. So you've got your um, elected officials, you've got your law enforcement, you've got your business, you've got um, health and human services, you've got, so this one, so they started going, so they go to the public school, and the public school, they delivered this question. If we could give you $25,000 and 2,000 man hours, what could you do with it? Now, I'd love to give all the details of the next two years of how this conversation, it wasn't just one conversation, it was a consistent conversation. It was beginning to meet together, have lunch together, have coffee together. The school's beginning to say, these guys are serious. <laughs> like, they are, these, these guys really want to help. And they didn't feel strings attached, which is a lot of times, unfortunately, when churches or Christian agencies step towards the town square, um, a lot of times you'll feel these strings. They, got, they have an agenda because we're really coming into, yeah, we really want to help you, but really what we want to do is proselytize. Um, the school didn't feel that. So the school says, well, actually, we are at the bottom of kindergarten readiness scores, um, 15 uh, public schools in Lancaster County districts and Peckway Valley was consistently between 13 and 14 on the ranking of the IU 13 kindergarten readiness scores. And if you know anything about overcoming poverty, generational poverty, when you come into school, uh, oftentimes families, uh, if you grew up in a home that is struggling financially, you come into school behind and then you tend to stay behind and it keeps this whole cyclical cycle moving. So, um, the school district said, you know, we would love to raise those scores. So, uh, the factory and this pa the church stepped back and said, let's hire a position for them. So, they hired uh, $65,000. They put out, hired a person, gave it to the school. So, on the factory's payroll, but working in the school, paid for by the church. Um, so, it's this three-way relationship. What ends up happening over time, <laughs> we lowered the kindergarten readiness scores. We are now, or raised them, I should say, we are now consistently, when the IU 13 puts those numbers out, we're consistently in the top five. Um, it was a program that was very focused. And here's the thing I like to say when I'm, when I'm talking, I don't say this when I'm talking with like the United Way and other organizations, but when I'm in a church, here's the thing I love to say. The, our Western faith is very much built on education. Most of our churches talk, we talk a lot, 
we read, encourage people to read, pray, and meet in small groups where we continue to do those things. And so if, if you're going to engage young people, they have to know how to read and so in our, to engage our Western faith uh, in many ways. So powerful movement, exciting things happening. The United Way of Lancaster County then, to fast forward the story, comes along and so they began to, resh to shift their funding model. And they began to say, okay, we don't just want to bring money in, taken out of people's paychecks, deducted for United Way, and then give it out to organizations. We want to see collective impact is what it's called. It's kind of the word it's called. It's collaborative efforts. It's organizations working together. So they said, looked in Lancaster, and they said, well, who, who is doing it already? They looked out to eastern Lancaster County in Peckway Valley, and they said, there it is. So we were the recipient of the largest United Way grant when they shifted to the collective impact funding model. We've come through two grant cycles now, significant income. And so when that did, all this work, this rolling your sleeves up to be a good neighbor, um, beginning to hire positions for outside of ourselves to serve our community, and then what begins to happen is now the United Way steps in, and we now have um, 18 uh, staff serving our community. And we are all about collaboration. It's at the very core of who we are. Um, the way I've learned to say it is um, we check our egos at the door. And if you're going to tackle any human need in, in this community or any community, so we're talking affordable, I don't know fully with Dairy Township, but I'm guessing affordable housing is an issue here. It's usually an issue, especially since you guys have Love, Inc., I'm guessing affordable housing is a, is a barrier. Transportation is often a barrier for those that are under-resourced. Education is difficult. So if you're going to step in and tackle drugs, opioids, you know, you get in that stuff. If you're going to tackle any of those, there isn't a single, or the, the very DNA of what we live on is there isn't a single organization that has within itself the ability to solve any one of those issues, including, and I, I, sometimes people push this a little bit, but including the Church of Jesus Christ. Now, we have the answer, we have the foundation, but to really tackle those things, we've got to learn to work together. And so what we do is we have 65 partnering organizations right now. Three of our staff members are shared staff. One of them is paid um, a third of their salary by us, a third by community action partners, and a third by the school district themselves. Um, they office in our building, but work in the school. We have another one that's solely paid by CAP, Community Action Partners, but in our building and working on our staff. And then we have that original position I talked about, which is paid for, which is now paid by the school, but working and is, and is literate on our payroll. Um, so very collaborative. We work with Tabor, Community Action Partners, LGH Penn Medicine, um, Lancaster, uh, the Ho Coalition and Homelessness, which is now Lanco My Home. You go down the list, we're all around the table, and we aren't just there cooperating, we're, we're collaborating. And, and the difference is, so if I have, um, if I come to you and I say, I've got a solution for a problem, let's say affordable housing, and this device here is going to solve, it really isn't, but it's going to solve affordable housing. And I'm going to come and I'm going to put it in the table and pitch my solution to you, You'll sit back and say, hmm, I like that. That works. And you know what? That'll really serve us and what we're trying to do. That's a beautiful thing, and we call that cooperation. And cooperation is powerful. It's, it's not a negative thing at all. Collaboration, though, is instead of me bringing this device and setting the table, it's me bringing the problem. We have affordable housing. We've got to tackle this. Let's roll our sleeves up collectively put our heads together. Now, a device may come out of it, or it may be something completely different, but that's, that's really collective work, and it's kind of the very DNA of, of who we are. So, with that said, I want to share some passages of Scripture, but are there any questions at this point? Zach, is there any online? Uh, none online? No questions. Any questions here in the room? And I'm having a hard time. Should I be? I keep trying to, ca I'm looking at this little camera here, and I keep, what's better? You're, you're going fine. Okay, <laughs> okay. Okay, I'll keep like trying to decide where am I looking. Um, I do have, before I share some passage of scripture, we have this here, it's over there, and if any of you online would like it, we can get a PDF of it. This is, this kind of gives an overview of our core values, collaboration sits right there at the top. Um, I also have this little uh, piece here, 
Um, it talks about resourcing, gives you a quick, a real quick overview. Um, it gives you how many individuals have engaged in our social services. So up till May, these numbers were in May, we had 171 people that were engaged in individual people, engaged in with a social worker. Um, 77,705 pounds of food served from January through May this year and 141 Peckway Valley students who attended our youth center um, uh, up until, oh, that was actually last year's number. So, and then you'll see also, we define poverty in a unique way. Um, we, we look at poverty as kind of a lack of resources, and it's not just physical, financial resources. We kind of look at six areas. So you can be impoverished spiritually, you can be impoverished relationally, uh, financially, emotionally, uh, physically, and intellectually. So really the factory doesn't just, a lot of times we think someone who doesn't have money, there are individuals that are making $75,000, $80,000 but engaging our services because they're incredibly under-resourced relationally um, or maybe they're in debt up to their eyeballs uh, or you know, uh, spiritually uh, impoverished as well. So that's that, this little sheet is also over here and I can get that PDF out to, to Jack or I guess Susan and um, uh, send that through. Any questions yet? None coming in. Okay, if you guys have questions, please shoot them out. I want to kind of, what I'd like to do, we'll wait for any questions to come in, I want to talk through the foundation of um, serving the poor from the scriptures. And uh, I'll set the foundation in Galatians chapter 2. Um, in Galatians chapter 2, you have the Apostle Paul who wrote Galatians to a church in Galatia. He is telling his story in chapter 2 of how he came to be a Christ follower. Uh, he starts out persecuting, if you, know, if you don't know anything about Paul, he starts out persecuting. He, he hates anything associated with, with the Jesus of Nazareth. And he's, anyone who associates with Jesus of Nazareth, it is his mission to wipe them off the planet. Um, he then is on a road to a town called Damascus and he, to, to basically destroy more Christ followers. And... He meets Jesus, the resurrected Jesus. This bright light blinds him, um, and basically God says to him, why are you persecuting me? Uh, Saul was his name at the time, goes into town. He meets some other Christ followers. Fast forward, he becomes a Christ follower himself, changes his name to Paul, and now it is his mission to plant churches all over uh, what would be the Middle East today, the, the kind of that, that region back then, Turkey. Um, over and his, and his dream was ultimately push into the Rome, which was world influencing at that point. So in Galatians chapter two, he's telling his story. He's telling a story of how this happened. He's telling a story of how he spent basically 14 years up to the point that I want to talk about. He talks about how he spent three years out in the wilderness with with Jesus. He talks about how he spent time with Peter. Um, he talks about um, how his call was to really to move out beyond the Jews uh, because, you know, it came through Jesus. It came through the Jews, Jesus of Nazareth. And so he's telling this story. And then he says this crucial point comes. And in the crucial point, it's basically you have the, this Jewish faith. Jesus comes along and says it's a new covenant. The Jews don't quite understand that because they're like, well, no, wait a minute. You're, you're, a, you're a Jewish rabbi. You're, this is coming out of the Jewish people. All the way back to Abraham, it was, it was hey, the Jews are going to bless all people. Um, this is the fulfillment of a lot of those Old Testament, like, yeah, this is Jewish. But now we have all these 14 years, Paul says. For 14 years, Paul's preaching to non-Jewish people, and they're accepting Christ. They're becoming Christ followers, but they're not getting circumcised, which is a big deal in the Old Testament and in the, in the, old, in the, in the covenant. So this debate breaks out. No, no, wait, no, wait, no. Are we, what is this? Like, can, don't we have to have them get, don't they need to honor our laws? And this whole debate breaks out. So Paul in Galatians 2 says, with a with bit of trepidation, he heads to Jerusalem. And he's going to go to Jerusalem to meet with kind of the way he calls it. Uh, I'll read it in a minute. But he calls like these the, the who's who of, of the Christian world in that day. Um, he's going to go meet James. He's going to go meet Peter. He's going to meet John. Like this is like, I mean, a picture 
you know, right now, I don't know who your heroes are. Maybe if you're in sports, you have a, a hero in baseball or football or uh, maybe if it's music or picture the, the, the big names in, in, your, in your field and imagine you're going to them <laughs> to engage with them, to even push on them a little because you're beginning to feel that they're going soft in something that you are pretty passionate about. So that's Galatians chapter 2. Now, in Acts 15, I want to read this passage to you. Acts 15, we have the story of that engagement. Um, there's a council. They pull together. They have this whole debate. They interact with one another. James kind of heads that council, the, the half-brother of Jesus. And they, they interact and talk, and they make a decision. They come to the end. And I want to read this to you. Um, I'm reading out of the, uh, and the New Revised Standard Version. Um, here for you guys that are familiar with that passage here at Derry. Uh, gets to the end. Um, here's the thing. Therefore, I have reached the decision that we should not trouble those Gentiles who are turning to God. Other translations will say this way. Therefore, we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. So in other words, no more circumcision. No more if you're going to follow Jesus, you've got to be circled. That's, that's done. No, let's not do this. But we should write to them to abstain, and listen, to abstain only from things polluted by idols and from fornication and from whatever has been strangled from blood. For in every city, uh, for generations past, Moses has had those to pro, uh, proclaim him, for he has, excuse me, been read aloud every Sabbath in the synagogue. So basically they say, we got two things we'd like you to honor. The entire Old Testament law and all the laws that are stamped on us. Listen, they're saying it's not about, the new covenant is new. It is about faith in Jesus. Let's not get it all wrapped up with these laws. We would like you to honor these two, just these two, because they've been with us from the start. Um, now, Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, Paul adds something which is so fascinating. In Galatians chapter 2, um, Paul reports on this, this same event, and he gets down to the end. He says, I'll start in verse 7. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel for the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel for the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter, making him an apostle to the circumcised, also worked through me in sending me to the Gentiles. So he says, hey, they began to see Peter is called to go to the Jewish people, I'm called to go to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, Peter, James, and John, who were acknowledged pillars, recognized the grace that had been given to me, they gave to Barnabas and me the right hand of fellowship, agreeing that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Then he adds this. They ask only one thing. Now, which is so fascinating because I know they ask two things, but the thing he lists isn't even one of those two things. They ask only one thing, that we remember the poor, which was actually what I was eager to do. James himself writes in uh, James, true religion is to look after the orphan and the widow, the under-resourced, the, those amongst us that don't have voice, that don't have power, the weakest um, from the start of the Christian faith this advancement of the message of Jesus, the heart has been to leave it connected with serving the poor. This is fascinating to me. What I find today, unfortunately, churches have a tendency, right? Or I don't know why this is. Um, I love churches. Like when I got on your website, I loved, what is your mission? It's, it's something the word of God, something with Jesus, and do justice. Is that right? Does I have that right? Um, I had made my heart sing when I was preparing to come over here. Because uh, churches have a tendency to either, they look at their role today as proclamation of the gospel and the word of God, or you've got these other churches that like, okay, well, that's really cool, but we're going to go be all about social justice. And churches tend today to kind of pull this thing. And I'm like, no, 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 it's, it, they should be together. The church at the very core should be proclaiming the gospel message of Jesus and the word of God and doing social justice and serving the poor. It should be stuck together. Um, and that's, that's the beauty of the gospel. And here's, I just want to share this 
Why, why I think this is so important is it leaves the gospel of grace together. I think when they get pulled apart and you have churches that over here and Christians who proclaim the gospel but aren't connecting to the poor, the gospel becomes very cruel. It becomes elitist. It becomes, it kind of, it's separatist. It pulls out. And I think what when we leave it together with serving the poor and as you walk with the poor, what I have learned walking with those who are under-resourced, I've learned it over and over and over, is all of us in life begin to forget what we've been given. There's this thought that's like, <laughs> there's this thought that begins to form like, I am a product of my hard work and good choices. Now, that's taught in scripture. Galatians chapter six, it is very clearly taught. If you make bad choices, you're gonna reap the fruit of those bad choices. If you don't work hard, you're gonna reap the fruit of not working hard. But that's not the totality of life. Ecclesiastes comes along and says time and chance happen to us all. And if we would go back through our lives and look at our lives, yes, there are things that have happened to us because of my hard work and good choices, but there is a significant amount of things in my life that have been given to me. That's the gospel of grace. And so when you can leave we, proclamation and serving the poor together, I think it leaves us, it keeps the gospel not becoming a law-driven thing, but a gracious thing, a kind thing, a generous thing. Uh, uh, it, it leaves flesh and blood to it. For example, uh, my dad um, it was, was a general manager of a significant company that sold about the time I was entering my second, third year of college. Because of that sale, he was able to pay for a large chunk of my schooling. Now, I was going to be a pastor. I was able to come out of school with only $3,500 of debt. Now, I look at that and I say, that is an incredible gift that had nothing to do with me. And I never had to live like many do with this incredible weight of, in essence, making another mortgage payment, trying to pay off $100,000 of school debt. I didn't have that. That was a gift to me. So yes, I worked hard in school. I worked my tail off, but boy, what a gift it was to time and chance happen to us all. Um, so that's it, 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 the, really the heart, the heart of the factory is us saying, man, let's keep these two together and let's serve. We're here to serve the local church, to help the local church keep those two together. So that's, that's um, the heart of that. So questions yet? No questions. Guys out there, you gotta have, you gotta have a, like, you got to at least ask me what's my favorite football team, right? Someone, <laughs> someone out there wants to know what my favorite football team is, I'm sure. Or do I have a dog? Or what's, what's my dog's name? Or um, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I can do one of two things here. I can talk more in depth in the factory. Um, or what would you like me to do? How about I'll let the... You guys out there can weigh in, or I'll have you guys. Uh, tell us about the growth of the factory, a little bit more about that. About the growth, okay. yeah. Okay, so the question was, talk about the growth of the, can we talk about the growth of the factory? Yes. Um, so the, what, what, we, what we really focused, it started as a youth center, is, is where it really started. As I said earlier, so let's serve the family. So we began to do that. And, and really where the growth has happened in, in I, I can't stress it enough, when, when organizations come to us, other organizations come and come looking to us to say, like for example, Conestoga Valley right now, if you're familiar with Lancaster County, is trying to start a hub, we call it a hub, because um, we everything coming together to send resources out is trying to start a hub like us. So they come to us and sit down and say, how do we do this? How did, how did you guys get here? And what I often say is, it is so important to remember context. It's not a cookie cutter thing. Yeah, there are principles that we've built upon, collaboration being the biggest one. We've really grown through collaboration, rolling our sleeves up, doing the hard work of listening and walking with other agencies and organizations. We get asked a lot with that growth. We'll get asked this. We get asked this a lot. Um, they'll say, now, you work with the public school, and we are, I mean, we have staff in the public school. 
The public school comes in and works with us. I mean, it's, we work with agencies that are not Christ-following agencies, and they'll say to us, how do you do that? Doesn't that blur the lines of church and state? We get asked this all the time. It's, it's one of the top questions we get asked. And I'll say, well, actually, what I've learned about collaboration is if you're going to collaborate well, you actually can't blur the lines. You actually have to make them bolder. You actually have to understand who you are, what your identity is, what your mission vision, what makes you unique. So we know that we're coming to the table because we have this unique piece to give to our community. And we know that the school is coming to the table because they have this unique piece to give to the community. And let's not blur that up. And so when we step into their territory, we leave our territory behind. And we walk into them, and we are there to serve them. When they step into our territory, they do the same. We they leave, and it really is a beautiful, powerful thing. So context um, is the superintendent at Peckway Valley. This is kind of stuff that, that is, is we're beginning to s- expand. We're moving from a youth center to a, um, an adult human service, and we begin to walk with adults on single fixed incomes and social security making 20,000 a year and living by themselves and trying to tackle affordable housing and health care and all the other stuff that goes with it. And we, now are, we now are dealing with adults, we're now dealing with teenagers um, and, and all those points in between. And then as the growth happens is we begin to say that that's, we now have element or uh, preschool actually getting kindergarten readiness, but then we were missing elementary. So we continue to work and continue to work all this collaborative stuff and then we add an elementary person. So now we cover the whole gamut and then the support staff around it. The context though is that collaboration drove us, sustainable healthy business models and practices drove us, but um, we were in the right place at the right time too. The superintendent is at Pequay Valley, has been there like eight years now, and when you look at the growth of the factory, it matches up with his presence. He walks in and he says, <laughs> He, I love him to death. Eric Orndorff is his name. Uh, I was at a uh, Lancaster Chamber event with him. And he stands up in front of all these business leaders. <laughs> and he says, he's telling the story of Peckway Valley and what they're about and what they're doing. And they, they ask us to come to the Chamber event because Peckway Valley's really begin to step into career-oriented education. Um, and so Eric stands up and Eric says, this is the heart of Eric. Eric says, you know, our high schools in Pennsylvania test and push for college. Everything about them are pointing to college, kids to college. And he says, the problem is our trades are some of the fields that need people the most. And he goes, the greater problem is, this is, this is what he says, he goes, the greater problem is when you look at last year's graduating class of Fequay Valley, we only sent 60% of our students to college. What have we done for the other 40%? And then he looks at the chamber and says, I don't know about you guys, but I call that malpractice. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm sitting there, I look at him, I'm like, this guy's amazing. So, he, he's, so that's, that's the context, and that's what I talk about collaboration. We, um, all this work was being done, but the superintendent was there before, a great superintendent, but they, they were, Eric walks in, and Eric's like, listen, he's very humble, and he's like, Guys, we want to make sure every learner has an opportunity to have their first choice after high school, whether that's college, be a welder, go into construction, be a nurse, what is their top choice? And so because of that context, he looks to organizations like us because he says, okay, if we're going to address the holistic student, we've got to address the social emotional needs of the student. And then that's when he says the school is not designed to do that. They recognize that. So that's that clear boundary that I talked about. So he says, ah, here's this organization. It's designed to do that. So when we want to deal with those pieces, let's really resource well with this organization to to complement the work of our social workers, our guidance counselors, et cetera. And that is really at the heart of our growth. That's really, again, that collaboration. But again, in the hard work that's been done, the networking, but also context is so important, the way it's at. And then United Way, that United Way grant, it was over $200,000. Now, I'm not going to lie. When you just get $200,000 dropped your way, it's for collective work, which we're already doing. It, it, it's, it's nice. <laughs> It'll move things along in a hurry. 
Um, so that's also, I, again, context. Uh, so when I, I met with Conestoga Valley, I said, you guys got to understand there was all these other pieces happening. It wasn't just our hard work and ingenuity, though we were working hard and very, a um, lot of innovation, but it was really the context. Does that, does that answer the question? Oh, um, it ran. Now, this is a tricky one. Um, I'll, I'll state something here. So we get asked a lot. I'll talk about qualifications. We'll get asked a lot on um, uh, do we take federal money? And we will say we do. We will take federal money. Matter of fact, right now, we ha we're in a building. This is, we, we're in the old Paradise Elementary School, which was right, and I just learned this, Jack's, who, who was the... Grandmother and uncle live literally on the house. I, my wife says all the time, she wants that house. It's a beautiful old Victorian house. It sits right next to our property. Um, but anyway, so that school was given to us for $1 from because of our partnership. Um, it, has an, it was built in 1917, the front end of it. The back end was built in the 1950s. The roof leaks like crazy. <laughs> When it rains, and rains heavy, I, I tell people it's like going to the water park at uh, Hershey Park. Like, put on your swimsuit and walk through the building, you're going to have a grand old time. Like, it leaks through, and we've worked like crazy to patch. And, but, so we reached out to the um, uh, community development block money, which is federal money, which we got $200,000 to address our roof this year. Now, what we're very, very clear about, what we tell people coming to the question about qualifications of staff, um, we won't take all federal money. Um, so that federal money said, do you proselytize? So if we proselytize, they were not gonna give us the money. So we said, okay, what do you mean by proselytize? What define that word? Because, and basically what they meant is not how, what we do. We introduce Jesus, if you will, proselytize through our social workers who are meeting with people in their office, and we do it. When you look at this card, you'll see the six resources. They take a survey when they come in. It's, it's to assess where they're at, and they rate where they're at um, on, on these six areas of resourcing. One of them is spiritual. So if they open the door to us, we walk with them. That's really the heart of how we how we quote unquote proselytize. So we're passionate about sharing the gospel of Jesus. We constantly look at opportunities. One of the things we do is local pastors serve pastoral offices in our building. So if they check that spiritual is reality, we will say to them, hey, we have a pastor that comes and meets here every Wednesday from this time to this time. Would you like to schedule time with him? Yes, we will. And then they connect. Um, so with that said, one of the requirements has been that we um, one of the first and foremost is a person on our staff that serve people must be a Christ follower. Um, so we had another grant that we looked at, federal grant, and it said to us, um, they asked the question, do you vet and discriminate on your board recruitment? And so we said again, define discriminate. They said, do you have qualifications for religion for your board members? We said, well, yes, we do. We're a faith-based organization. It's very important that our governance board are followers of Jesus. We walked away from that money. It was, it was a hundred and some thousand dollars, and we've said as an organization, uh, we don't, God will bless us in another way. Um, so it's very granular. So followers of Jesus um, in the human service roles. Uh, so we don't, uh, we may have market individuals that work in our market and some others, maintenance, that, that we don't quite hang that as high up there, though they often are. Um, we do not require masters of social work. So we don't have anyone. Matter of fact, the way we've said it, is people ask this question a lot. Are they, so we have, an we have people on staff with social work degrees and psychology degrees, but we don't go out looking for clinically trained social workers. The way I, what I say is what we're looking for are people who understand ministry. And sometimes the way people are trained in social work in school is not ministry focused love of people. Um, for example, I will give out my cell number to, um, we call them participants instead of clients, and they'll have my cell number. Well, you talk to a social worker, they're like, whoa, no, wait a minute, that's a violation of, so we actually 
we're, the way I look at it, our social workers are more um, what I would call care pastors in a church context, walking with people. So we love people with theology degrees because we believe theology d informs much of your life, understanding people and psychology and understanding the systems in social work, but we don't require it. Was that a muddy answer? Was that? Okay. Yes. Um, so, the, so you want to know what we do? Yeah. Um, so the question in the room is about mental health. So really cool thing, because of our collaboration in this massive building we have, we've been able to bring um, organizations into our building. So one of them is the Community Service Group, CSG. Community Service Group works is the primary mental health agency that Peckway Valley contracts with in the school district. So we scratched our head and we're like, oh, wait a minute, they're building relationships with the students and their families in the school. Why don't we give them office in our building? So they actually have an office space in our building right there in our, in our building. Now they're not a, again, this is what I love. They're not a Christian um, faith-based mental health agency. Uh, but they step into mental health and work with it in a beautiful way. So we have them, and then we have other agencies that we outsource to as well um, with mental health. Mental health is one of the biggest, I will tell you, mental health is one of the greatest challenges to those in poverty, uh, that the under-resourced. There are not a lot of resources, uh, or the, the, let me put it this way, there are a lot of resources. The resources are not, um, what's the right word? They're lacking. The, the breadth and the depth of them and the, the availability to have them and the cost of them and the barriers to get in them is, is, is a significant uh, challenge to us. So right now we have CSG, we have other agencies we'll outsource to, uh, but it's an issue we consistently keep asking, how do we, how do we grow and build in this one? Got like four minutes. I think we're wrapping up. I think we're wrapped up. Beautiful, we're wrapped up, okay. Okay, awesome. Thank you guys. Thank you. Before, so see, yeah. I will get PDF versions of what's here. Uh, I'll leave a few here too. So if you want to swing by the, is that possible? Can they swing by the office at all this week? So I'll leave some of the literature here. If you guys want to swing by and grab an actual paper copy, that's cool too. My business card, I'll leave some of them as well. So anyway, thank you guys. Appreciate you. Thanks for what you're doing here and serving your community. Awesome. You started out with It's always a risk. Yeah. All right. Thanks for having me. Uh -huh. I'm all bummed. My my daughters and my wife.